Okay, so last time, what did we talk about? Um, we kind of, we talked about sort of discrete time simulation of dynamics. So how do you get your nice continuous ODEs into a computer? Um, we talked about some of the gotchas associated with doing that. We talked about stability uh, of discrete time sort of stuff. And we talked about, you know, sort of the weird things that can happen as an artifact of discretiza uh, discretization and how you should kind of be careful for that, of that sort of thing and keep an eye out. Um, we talked about, in particular, some methods we talked about for, for this sort of discretization. We talked about um, forward and backward Euler, also known as explicit and implicit Euler. And then we talked also about the classic fourth order runga kata method, which is basically the go-to method uh, if, it, if it's the first thing you should try. Uh, cool. And then we talked on the control side about how to discretize controls. And we talked about um, zero and first order uh, hold on the controls. So that's pretty much the recipe for, for taking your nice continuous ODE. So you've got your dynamics, your robot, whatever. Um, you, you can discretize the continuous ODE with RK4 uh, as kind of the go-to and, and maybe some other method. And then basically decide on kind of zero order or first order hold on the controls. Um, and now you've got your nice um, discrete uh, formulation that you can simulate in the computer and that you're kind of now ready to go do kind of numerical uh, optimal control stuff with. So today, um, we're going to kind of make a pivot. So we've been doing some dynamics background. Now we're going to sort of start heading in the, the main sort of thrust direction of the course. Uh, and we're going to start talking about kind of a, a background sort of discussion about optimization. So I'm not going to assume that you've done any optimization before. Um, It'll be kind of a nice little self-contained couple of lectures to give you enough background on numerical optimization to sort of be dangerous and, and like understand what we're going to talk about. The subject goes a lot deeper. Um, and I'm we'll put you uh, put some references up on the piazza to like go further. If you want to talk more about this stuff, feel free to talk to uh, me or the, the TAs, all of whom have done lots of this stuff. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll kind of at least get you started in this uh, field and hopefully give you enough to. To, um, to, to, to get going. So the first thing we're going to talk about is notation and um, sort of notation for specifically for writing down derivatives, Jacobians, gradients, Hessians, this kind of stuff, just to make sure we're all clear on this. Then we're going to talk about root finding. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, unconstrained minimization. Uh, so we're going to talk about specifically about numerical algorithms for solving those, those two kinds of problems. Uh, okay, so let's get into it. So the first topic of conversation is um, some notation stuff that uh, we, will, we will not argue about. Uh, we, will just, we will just do it this way uh, in this class. Uh, if you want to do it some other way in your own you know, life outside of this class, that's fine with me. But um, this, this is the correct way, uh, according to me, and, and how we're going to do it. So first off, um, so we're going to say, given some f of x, that is a uh, scalar-valued function that eats uh, vectors in Rn and spits out scalars. So this is sort of the sort of function that you that we generally try to to optimize, right? Uh, this would be like a loss function or a cost function, right? Something that eats a big vector and gives you some scalar scalar cost uh, as an output. So this kind of function, um, very often we want to take derivatives of these things, right, for, for optimization purposes. So for us, we're going to write down partial f partial x, uh, often called the gradient here in this setting. This is a um, for us, this is always going to be a row vector, so one by n. So 
So gradients are always row vectors well, for, for a scalar valued function of a vector. Uh, and there's good reasons for this. A lot of people write these as column vectors. That is wrong. It's a row vector for the, for the following couple of reasons. Um, I'm waiting for someone to push back on me with this. But uh, here, here, are, here are my rationalizations for why this is the right way to do it. Um, so the first one is partial f partial x, the gradient here, is the, the linear operator. that maps um, little changes in x, so little delta x's, into little changes in f, so, so delta f's. And so like if I take a first order Taylor expansion of f about x, I get you know, f of x plus partial f partial x times delta x, right? And so for this to work out just in terms of dimensions, delta x is a you know, n by one vector, uh, the same size dimension as x, right? And the output of this thing has to be a scalar to make sense. And so therefore, partial f partial x has to be a row vector such that partial f partial x times delta x comes out to be a scalar, right? Um, okay, so that's one reason. And we're, there's one more reason that we're going to get to in a sec, but we're going to keep kind of moving in this vein. So um, similarly, uh, if I have a function, say g of y, a different function now, that is a function that eats a vector of size m and spits out a vector of size n. So a uh, vector valued function of a vector, right? So this would be maybe like a dynamics function or something like that, right? Um, if I take the derivative of this guy, aka uh, its Jacobian matrix, so partial g, partial y, this thing has dimension n by m. And it's for the exact same reason I want the uh, the first order Taylor expansion to work out. So I want, you know, g of y plus delta y to sort of approximately be g of y plus partial g partial y delta y. And for that partial g partial y matrix linear operator, whatever you want to call it, for, the, for that to work out dimensionally, it has to be the, the right size to multiply delta y and the right size to spit out uh, a delta G on the other side, right? So just dimensionally, that's, that's how we kind of figure these things out. Okay, so those are kind of, that's one reason why, and the real reason why we wanna be consistent about these, these notation things and these sort of dimension conventions for derivatives is that it makes sure that the chain rule still works. That is the real reason. So both of these are, are super important for this real reason. So if I sort of take these two functions I've written down and I compose them, right? Uh, and I write down like f of g of y plus delta y. And I Taylor expand this to first order. This is approximately f of g of y plus partial f partial x evaluated at g of y times partial g, partial y, evaluated at y times delta y. And this sort of multiplication of these guys, the partial f, partial x, and the partial g, partial y, works out because of the consistency of these, these uh, rules. Uh, so you might you know, have seen in other courses or books or whatever, gradients being written as column vectors, and then this sort of has a transpose in it. Um, if you do that, then a bunch of this stuff starts to break down and act weird, and you end up with lots of bugs in your code where you need to randomly transpose matrices all over the place. 
uh, to debug and it's really messy and really annoying and, and a huge sort of source of pain and suffering for no reason. So um, stick to these conventions, chain rule works, your code is nicer, you don't have transpose bugs all over the place. Uh, and then because this stuff shows up so often and, and as a nod to the other convention, uh, we're also just for convenience, we, we're gonna also define some other stuff. So if I write partial F, partial X, I mean the row. If I write grad or nabla F of X, this is gonna be the column version. So this is partial F, partial X, transpose. And this is the, the column vector version then, right? And then um, I'm also going to define the Hessian del squared f of x. And this is, you can write this a bunch of ways. So this is uh, partial, partial x of grad f of x equals you know, d squared f dx squared. Um, and this is a square n by n matrix. And uh, this one is like a little bit less of a big deal because it should be symmetric. So it doesn't really matter what order you do things in. Um, and it's, it equals its own transpose. But that said, you know, that's, that's kind of the right way to define it. Okay, so any questions about this? Anyone have any, anyone want to argue against my uh, sort of standard convention stuff here? Be my guest. Okay, cool. So we'll kind of keep moving. Someone asked about forward diff specifically. Uh, forward diff, uh, if you call it and ask for a gradient, it will give you the column. So it is, it generally does it the wrong way. <laughs> so you have to be careful. Uh, okay, so next up, we're gonna get into root finding right now. Okay, so what are we doing here? So, uh, the main idea here is I have some function, say f of x. Um, and I want to find some x star such that f of x star equals zero. So I want to find a zero crossing, a root, whatever you want to call it, of a given function f, right? Um, so a, an example of this that we, can I read, sorry, like a, a dynamics example of this that we've already seen uh, that we will revisit many times is uh, finding an equilibrium point for a continuous time dynamical system, right? Um, Okay, and just uh, sort of a, a super closely related concept um, to this is a, uh, a fixed point that we, sh we should also talk about this. And the idea here is Rather than f of x star equals zero, we want f of x star to equal x star. So we want um, you want the function to spit back, you know, the, the same the same input. Uh, can anyone anyone know what where like a sort of analogous sort of equilibrium concept for this one for fixed point based on what we've talked about last time? Say equilibrium. So specifically, equilibrium for what? So the the zero one, the the root right, is an equilibrium point for a continuous time dynamics function. The fixed point is an equilibrium point for a discrete time dynamics function. Right? Does that make sense? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, um, so these are sort of, yeah, these are things we'll run into a lot. Uh, we'll be doing this stuff a lot. And sort of those are kind of simple examples. Okay, so if I give you an F and I ask you for, for one of these things, either one, uh, does anyone have any thoughts on how you go about doing that? Suggestions? Nobody has any thoughts? No one's done this before? I know some of you guys have done this before. Newton's method? Yeah, so Newton's method is kind of the gold standard and um, we're gonna talk about that. Um, First, I want to mention just briefly a, um, a simpler kind of method, which is called fixed point iteration. And the idea here is uh, specifically for the fixed point case, if your fixed point is a stable fixed point in the sense of a dynamics function, then you can get to the fixed point by just running the dynamics forward, right? So by just iterating f of x a bunch of times, if it's if you're in the basin of attraction for a stable fixed point, the dynamics will just naturally move you down into the fixed point and you'll land at the fixed point eventually. So that's what fixed point iteration is. Uh, so this is super simple. but it only works on stable fixed points. And I'm putting this in quotes here because in a lot of cases, these aren't dynamics, right? They can be anything. I have a terminology question about yep. that. Sure. Um, so when we say dynamics, are we just referring to this like generic x dot equals f of x u? So there doesn't have to be like accelerations involved necessarily. Yeah. So this is like so in this case, actually, what I'm we're talking about the discrete time version, right? Which is x k plus one equals f of x k. Uh, but yeah, either way, continuous or discrete. Uh, this is sort of a slightly more abstracted right, way of thinking about a dynamics model. So we can take that, you know, from F equals MA, we can take it from, you know, completely unrelated branch of physics could be like a fluid dynamics model, could be a, mm. an electrical model, right, uh, of a circuit, you know, it could be uh, literally anything, right. And we just take, um, so dynamics, like in its most generic form here refers to uh, any sort of, um, Anything that sort of time that that changes with time is what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, that can be modeled by some some function, right? So it's a function that's uh, given given some state at some initial time. I can use this dynamics function to propagate the state forward in time. Like that's what it refers to. And given any sort of model of this, we can always kind of put it into this standard form, either of a first order vector differential equation x dot equals f of x, or a sort of um, discrete time map x k plus one equals f of x k. So you can kind of always, whatever your physics is, is or wherever you're getting this, you can always kind of smush things into that form. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're kind of dealing with that slightly more abstract general form here uh, and throughout the class. So we're kind of agnostic okay. in here how you get the f. Uh, we're kind of just assuming you have one and then, then we can do control on it. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, so so what you do uh, here, right? This is just you know x gets f of x until it converges, right? Until like x no longer is changing. Uh, super simple, but um, only works on um, stable, you know, fixed points and. Um, it has slow convergence.
meaning it can take a really long time for uh, from a given starting guess to land at X star. So a lot, a lot of iterations. So that's one way to go. That's sort of the simplest thing to do. Um, a quick better, question. Yeah. Uh, so for this, uh, is this only for discrete time for like continuous time? You'd have to integrate, right? Like some so, sort of thing. Um, this specifically refers to this fixed point uh, thing. So yeah, in general, this would be for like a discrete time uh, equilibrium point or some other system where you're looking for a fixed point, where you're looking for, you know, f of x star equals x star. And you can kind of trivially switch these things back and forth. Um, but yeah, th does that make sense? This is the, yeah, this is the discrete time version right Got here. It. Okay. So um, it's really easy though to go back and forth. So if I have a, if I have an x star equals f of x star sort of uh, situation, I can turn that into a root finding problem by just moving everything over to the right, right? So I can do like f of x star minus x star equals zero, and now I have a root finding problem. Does that make sense? So I, yep. can, so I can transform one into the other kind of super easily. Okay, cool. So now what we're going to talk about is the better way. Um, and kind of the standard way that, and we're going to use this a ton in the class, and hopefully everyone's seen this before somewhere. So this is uh, sort of the, the granddaddy of all optimization kind of methods. Uh, Newton's method, the idea here is um, I have my f of x. As long as I have access to its first derivative, I can fit a first order Taylor expansion to f at my current guess point x. So that looks like you know f of x plus delta x is approximately f of x plus partial f partial x times delta x. So cool, I have this Taylor expansion in some small correction delta x, right? Now in delta x, this is a linear function, right? And in particular, that means I can always solve it, or almost always. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this approximation to zero and solve for delta x, solve for the correction. So I do, you know, f of x plus partial f partial x times delta x equals zero implies delta x equals minus partial f partial x inverse f of x. Uh, cool, now I take the delta x that I just solved for and I apply this as a correction. So x gets, oops, x gets x plus delta x. And then I repeat Uh, until convergence. So I just keep doing this until uh, I stop, sort of, uh, until I sort of get to the get to the root, and x is no longer changing. And at that point, I found x star. Uh, cool. So I think we should probably just go ahead and do this. So let's fire up Jupiter. Yeah. So like. Just notation wise, like if that uh, partial f partial x is a row vector, what what is like meant by the inverse x yeah, so there? <laughs> specifically like here the mechanics of that. Yeah, so so this does not apply to to that setting. Okay, um, okay, cool. This would this be like a scalar valued function. Yeah. A scalar valued function or a a, a vector uh, valued function of a vector. Yeah, by, okay. That makes know, sense. Rn to Rm. So this yeah, does you have not a square. Basically, what happens in these other cases where it's not a square matrix, uh, where it's it's like rectangular, uh, these are either underdetermined or overdetermined problems. So, i.e., like you have more variables than um, uh, on the input side than you do zeros on the output side. In which case, there's potentially a null space there where there's not a unique solution, or the opposite, where you have like an overdetermined problem where you have like uh, essentially like more output zeros than you have input uh, x's to twiddle. 
and therefore, like you, you can't necessarily find a uh, an optimum or a, a root. Uh, so, like, there's some sort of like issues along those lines. If that, that makes sense. So yeah, those, yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So this specifically, we're talking about the scalar case right now, but in in general, this applies to square systems or scalar systems. Uh, this this root finding thing that we're doing now. There's more to say about this in in more general settings. Um, those specific two examples I just mentioned, they don't have solutions like classical solutions like this, but they can have least squares solutions, right? So there's like extensions of these ideas that that still work out. Okay, so just to double check, can everyone see my uh, my Jupyter notebook right here? Yeah. Awesome. We can see. Okay. Zoom is acting uh, weird. Um, sorry, can someone just talk at me really quick so I know that we're still here? This thing is acting super, super weird. I'm sorry. So it sounds like people are here in general, so that's good. All right, let's do it. So um, here's a, Ju a Jupyter notebook running Julia code. Um, we didn't get a chance to do this really last time because of all the technical challenges. So here's, this is just importing a package um, and, and setting some stuff up. Uh, uh, for the, the package management system um, so that like when you guys go run this, I'm going to post this on GitHub so you can try it yourselves. This will make sure that you pull in all the same versions of the packages as I have. So this will work for you. Um, then I'm just importing a few standard packages. So linear algebra, which gives us matrix math, forward diff, which is on homework zero, which we're going to use a ton in the course, which is an automatic differentiation package that lets us just write down a random function and then ask uh, Julia for its uh, gradient, Hessian, Jacobian, whatever, and it'll give us exact um, uh, uh, derivatives, and then just pyplot for, for plotting here. So these we're going to use these packages. Um, what we're going to go through in this example is um, we're going to revisit the backward Euler method that we talked about last time, and we're going to um, use both fixed point iteration and Newton's method to solve for xk plus one, to solve that root finding problem for the next time step in the backward Euler method that we talked about. So here's a pendulum like we did last time, the continuous dynamics, and then I'm going to discretize those uh, continuous dynamics with backward Euler. So, um, you know, xk plus one equals xk plus time step times f of xk. And this is written down right here as a fixed point iteration to solve that thing. So I basically make an initial guess of xk plus one equals xk. Um, and then I just loop, the, I have a loop here where I just keep plugging it back in to, uh, to the backward Euler sort of condition until it hits some convergence tolerance. This works on this system, uh, but it doesn't work all the time, right? There's some stability caveats to this working, but it does work in this problem because it's a pretty benign problem. Here, um, this version- Quick is... question. Yeah. Do you think the screen is moving because we can't see any movement on the share screen right now? Ah, okay, give me one sec. Uh, what is it? Oh, uh, let's try this again. Sorry, man, I, I, I'm really- having a rough time with all this stuff this time around. How about now? Can you guys see it again? Yes. Okay. Yeah, much Perfect. better. Awesome, thanks. Sorry about that. This has been like a hellish uh, Zoom teaching experience this time around with the technical stuff between dying laptops and whatever else. Okay, so backward Euler with uh, fixed point iteration. And so like we said, we just literally just keep plugging uh, our current X back in and, and looping this until it converges. And this, in this particular case, this works because it's uh, a nice stable kind of uh, mapping and it's pretty benign. It doesn't work in general, uh, so, so caveat. Uh, and then here's the same backward Euler, but done with Newton's method. So let's take a look at this. So we're gonna make an initial guess that the next time step is the current time step. I'm gonna plug this into my uh, backward Euler dynamics. And what I've done here, right, backward Euler is x at the next time step equals x at the current time step plus time step times f of x. Here, down here, what I've done is turn this into a root finding problem by just moving xn over to the right-hand side, right? So I've got what I had before minus xn, and this thing is supposed to equal zero, right? Um, so I'm going to do root finding on this specific function here. I turned the fixed point into a root finding problem. 
Uh, and I'm going to call this function my residual. So this is the thing that I'm driving to zero, this residual function. Cool. So I take, uh, I take I compute this residual function. I evaluate its norm. And then I what I'm trying to do is drive that norm to zero. And here I've put in a tolerance of 10 to the minus 8, which is not particularly tight tolerance, but you know that, that's good enough for us. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to use this forward diff package uh, that lets us get derivatives for free. I'm going to call forward diff dot Jacobian, which is going to give me the Jacobian of this um, residual function. So I, I ask for the Jacobian of this guy, this residual thing, uh, at the current xn. Then right here is the Newton step. So I um, do minus, you know, dr dx uh, inverse times r. So this is the backslash operator. So if anyone's used MATLAB before or Julia before, this basically means uh, dr uh, inverse times r, right? But it's a more efficient way of solving that problem. Uh, it's this is the way you should solve linear systems, basically. So this is, you know. Um, dr, the Jacobian backslash times r. This is my Newton step. Uh, I apply that as a correction on xn, get my new xn. I plug the new xn back in to the residual function, evaluate the residual function, evaluate this, um, uh, this er the, the norm of the residual again, and, and then I go around the loop until this is small, until this is less than 10 to the minus 8. So there's my, my Newton version, just like what we wrote down in the notes, just implemented in code. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and simulate the pendulum using both methods, using backward Euler with the fixed point iteration and backward Euler with the, the Newton uh, root finding algorithm. And uh, so we just ran those for, I don't know, a few seconds. We're going to plot these guys, plot the solutions that is, right? Uh, so I, I guess yeah, I ran it for 10 seconds at 100 hertz. And this is what we would have seen last time if my computer hadn't died. Uh, this is showing you the, the pendulum simulation and this sort of uh, energy damping behavior that backward Euler has that we talked about last time that's just kind of inherent to the backward Euler algorithm. Uh, and what you see here is I've actually plotted both the uh, fixed point and Newton versions on top of each other on the same plot. And you can see they're exactly on top of each other. They match, which you would expect since the actual like discretization is the same. I'm just changing how I'm solving that, that root finding problem. Uh, and just to drive that point home, the two solutions agree with a maximum error between them of 10 to the minus six, which is fine considering my tolerances were pretty low over here. So they agree to like six decimal places, that's pretty good. So uh, now what I wanna do is, so I, I kept track of how many iterations it was taking these guys to uh, solve both fixed point uh, and, and uh, Newton, how many iterations it took to get to the, the solution tolerance. So let's take a look at that. So to solve this root finding problem to like 10 e minus eight, 1 e minus 8 tolerances, the fixed point iteration took about 14 iterations. And you kind of see what that looks like. The Euler, or so the, the Newton version, takes about three iterations. So you can see uh, one of these is better. <laughs> That's sort of obvious. And just to like drive that home a little bit more, here's a plot. And it, uh, what you'll see in particular is that um, if you look at these lines, essentially um, the fixed point iteration has kind of linear convergence uh, as a function of iteration count, whereas Newton has quadratic convergence. So um, what that means roughly is that with Newton, you double the number of significant digits in your answer. The number of digits of precision in your answer basically doubles each iteration. And you can kind of see that here. The first one we have like a couple digits, then we have about six digits, then we have about 15 digits. So it's even a little better than that in this particular problem, but roughly speaking, you'll double the number of digits uh, of precision in your answer at each iteration, assuming you're close, uh, your starting guess is pretty close. So this basically with Newton, you can nail the answer all the way to like full machine precision. This is full double precision down here at right? 10 to the minus 15. Whereas with fixed point iteration, gradient descent kind of stuff, it can take a ton of iterations and you're you're going to have a really hard time getting to really tight tolerances like you're you're you won't be able to get super super accurate like machine precision level accurate answers in general with those methods or it's a lot harder to do that uh cool any questions about this do you want anyone want me to try anything weird while while we're here we'll come back to the to the, the jupiter stuff too uh -oh. 
I'll go ahead and switch back. Yes. All of my all of my internets and computer things are not cooperating today, <laughs> or last time for that matter. My iPad is connected. Okay, I think we're back. Okay, so that's Newton's method. We did it in code, saw it kind of work against the fixed point iteration thing. Um, so let's just write down some quick notes about this. So also now you know how to do implicit integration, right? How to use an implicit method like backward Euler. Um, so takeaway stuff. Um, we get very fast convergence with Newton. It's sort of a gold standard in terms of convergence rate. It's really the best you can do. And if you can do it, you should do it. Um, so some sort of like takeaway messages on this. First one is um, Newton gives you quadratic convergence. So double the significant digits in your answer at each iteration, which is awesome. It means you can easily get to um, machine precision. Really quickly. Um, how about uh, does anyone have any thoughts on like uh, why we might not do full up Newton like this? If it's so it's great, expensive. yeah, it's expensive to compute the inverse. Yeah, so it's it's not only expensive to to solve that linear system, like kind of compute this inverse effectively. It also can be expensive to even compute that Jacobian if you're if you're dealing with a really really large problem, right? It also doesn't do well with um, not analytical functions or if there's like discontinuities, right? Yeah. So one thing we didn't talk about is um, for this to work. Uh, you need at least uh, a C1 function. And really the, the technical, there's some technical details in here for uh, sort of officially for, um, for Newton to work, you need to have um, Lipschitz continuous first derivatives. That's sort of the official math sort of thing. You, there are some like, there's some wiggle room on this and you can use it on non-smooth functions actually and still do okay. Um, as long as they, there are sort of only, um, occasional like uh, discontinuous sort of spots in those first derivatives. So you can actually do it on functions with kinks as long as there aren't too many kinks, it still kind of works. But the convergence rate is slower, um, is kind of the deal. So, so yeah, like you do need some smoothness properties for it to work well. Uh, but yeah, the, the big thing is that um, solving the linear system is uh, O n cubed. So if your system's really, if n's really big, can be very expensive. Um, that said, for a lot of cases, uh, like in particular the ones we're gonna deal with, these kind of trajectory optimization, motion planning, also control problems, um, the problems have a lot of structure. Uh, and specifically what I mean by structure here is that the Jacobians and Hessians of these problems, uh, these really big optimal control problems, 
they're very sparse. So the, the matrices we get have lots of like, they'll maybe have like, they might be like block diagonal or block banded and lots and lots of zeros. And as a result, if you're clever uh, about solving the, these linear systems uh, in such a way that you kind of only keep track of the non-zero blocks and kind of don't do anything with the, the zeros and you kind of harness that sparsity, uh, you can do way better than n-cubed. And as a result, we can actually solve huge optimal control problems like tens of thousands of variables uh, on, a, on a laptop uh, pretty quickly. So, so you can still solve big problems, but you have to be smart about it and have to leverage problem structure. And we'll talk more about this. A quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, does that also have a singularity problem because of the inverse? Yeah, so we're going to talk more about this very soon. That's uh, okay. a good point. Um, but yeah, so um, you have to invert the Jacobian, right? And that thing, therefore, has to be invertible. And uh, you can get into weird situations where uh, it goes singular and stuff like this. So there are kind of like basically hacks for fixing that up, uh, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So yeah, technically there's some issues there, but as long as the singularities are like isolated at isolated points and not everywhere, then it's it still works and you can kind of fix that. Um, cool. Okay, uh, any other questions on root finding, Newton, this sort of thing? So we're going to now start talking about optimization, specifically minimization. And this is the first sort of great void between optimal control and reinforcement learning. In optimal control, we always minimize. And in RL, people tend to maximize rewards. So you know that's one of the big differences. Uh, so let's talk now about sort of a, a little bit different kind of problem. Um, so minimize some, we have some function f of x, uh, a scalar valued function from rn to r. And we want to minimize this thing uh, with respect to x, right? So um, how should I do this? The function convex? Uh, I don't know. Might be, might not be. In general, no, but we're going to assume for now that it's smooth. So we'll assume that it has, sort of, say, Lipschitz continuous first derivatives, like we've been kind of saying. Or, or here, actually, we're going to generally assume C2 smooth. So we'll assume these things have nice first and second derivatives for, for our purposes in this class. Uh, it takes the derivative and solve for zero. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to turn this minimization problem into a root finding problem. And everybody's seen this before, right? Freshman calculus. Um, so as long as f is smooth, which we're going to assume it is, then this partial f, partial x uh, gradient at a minimum x star equals 0. And so what this has done is now we have a root finding problem, right? I basically um, can now solve a root finding problem on grad f. And I can now play the same games we just talked about. In particular, I can apply Newton's method to the function grad f equals 0, right? So I'm going to apply Newton's method to, to the gradient now. OK. Um, and yeah, I want to drive this point home because this is a, a, a point of confusion. A lot of people, you know, think about Newton as an optimization algorithm, and and like have seen it in that context, and it gets talked about 
kind of compared to, um, to gradient descent and stuff like this. Newton's method is really not a minimization uh, algorithm. It's really a root finding algorithm. And what we're doing when we do minimization or maximization with Newton's method is we're actually taking the minimization problem, transforming it into a root finding problem by using this gradient equals zero trick, um, and then applying the Newton root finding method to the gradient equals zero condition. Uh, this is also called first order necessary condition uh, or KKT condition. We're gonna talk more about that stuff. Um, okay, so, so what we do then is we'll take the function uh, grad f of x and we're gonna do our Newton thing. So x plus delta x in there. This guy's approximately grad f evaluated at x plus uh, partial respect to x of grad f uh, times delta x. And here, right, this guy, uh, this is just my vanilla Newton recipe. It just so happens, right, this is our Hessian. So this is del squared f of x. And we set this guy equal to zero. Um, and then we solve for delta x. So delta x equals, in this case, um, minus del squared f value of x inverse, so that Hessian inverse times um, uh, grad f. Right. I just solve the equation above for the delta x, and then I apply kind of the correction just like before. And kind of repeat until convergence, right? So is that, that clear to everybody? I'm doing exactly the same thing as before, just to grad F to do this minimization thing. Okay, so let's see, what else is there to say about this? Um, so a little bit of intuition now, if we kind of think about this a little bit, what this is kind of doing, uh, just looking at the, the Taylor expansion kind of math in there, I've got the Hessian and the gradient kind of floating around in here. So uh, one way to, kind of intuitively think about what's going on is that I'm um, fitting a quadratic approximation to f of x using the, the second order tail expansion, right? The gradient and the Hessian. And then I'm exactly minimizing that quadratic approximation, which I can do, right? I just did the math for that. Okay, questions about this? All right, so uh, we'll go ahead and do it now. Peter cooperates and doesn't do weird things to me again. All right, so let's do some minimizing. So here we go again, uh, same package stuff as before. And um, I'm just gonna write down a random polynomial function for fun. Here we go. So it's like x to the fourth plus x to the third minus x squared minus x. So this is my f. Um, because it's a nice little polynomial, I wrote down the derivatives by hand in closed form. So here's the gradient of f, and here's the Hessian of f. And so we can look at this guy. Here we go. We're going to plot it uh, sort of in the neighborhood of the origin. So nice little smooth polynomial function. And um, we're going to do some minimizing. So let's, um, so here's uh, my Newton step. Uh, for the minimization problem, right? Uh, I sort of do, you know, Hessian inverse minus Hessian inverse times gradient. And I solve this with backslash in the usual way. That's a Newton step. Um, I'm gonna now, we're gonna play some games. So let's see, what do I wanna do first? Let's sort of plot this guy. So I wanna do Newton from um, some initial starting guess. Let's use, we'll start at one. Okay, so here's, here's where I'm starting over here. 
And then we're going to do Newton on this guy. Does anyone have any thoughts on what's going to happen? What should happen? What would we like to happen as I run Newton on this guy? It'll convert to that closer, uh, the closest minimum. Yeah, so we think it's probably going to go down here, right? So let's try that out. So one iteration, there we go. It's moved down. It's pretty close to the bottom. Two iterations, it's basically there, right? Let's do one more just in case. It barely moves, so okay. So yeah, basically three iterations and we, we we're there. So that's kind of consistent with our previous experience of Newton being really fast. Um, and getting us to the bottom, you know, in, in like three or four iterations. Cool. Let's start it somewhere else now. So let me start it like over here somewhere. So maybe like one and a half, uh, minus one and a half right on the left. That's where I want to go. Okay, so let's start that out on the other side now. What do we think is going to happen from here? What do we think this is going to do now? We'll converge at minus one. Yeah, somewhere over here, right? It's probably gonna get, so it's right, it's gonna find basically find the, the closest local uh, local minimum, right? So we think it's probably gonna go down and, and kind of land here and stay there. And that's a local minimum. So that's probably right. Let's try it out. So yeah, that seems to be happening. Cool, two, three iterations. We're there, right? Okay, so like three iterations, nailed it. Cool. So that's pretty consistent. We think that that all makes sense. Um, let's try another one. So now I'm going to start it sort of in the middle somewhere. So let's try like zeros, you know. Okay, so now what do we think is going to happen? Who wants to take a guess? It's going to go to uh, 0 0.6. Yeah, zero. so we think it's going to go back to this right minimum here? Yes, I think so. Okay, that's a reasonable guess. Let's see what happens. Uh, okay, so we'll do a Newton step. Ooh, what's happening? Let's take another one. Ooh, we converged to something else. What do you think yeah, happened? That's true. Yeah, it's because the slope is zero also. So yeah. at that point. So, yeah. so this is going back to what we said about Newton not really being an optimization or minimization or maximization algorithm. It's a root finding algorithm, right? And to get it to work on this, minimization problem, we wrote down this gradient equals zero condition, and we're doing root finding on that. But that doesn't tell us if we're going to get to a max or min. It's just going to go to the nearest fixed point, right? The nearest gradient equals zero spot. And in this case, when I started here, the closest one was this max local max, right? So Newton's method doesn't care if I'm maximizing or minimizing. It's just going to go to the nearest local flat spot, which could be a max or a min. So in this particular case, it turned out that was that was over here. Uh, cool. So so that's a little weird, and we we kind of don't like that, right? That's um that's something we want to avoid. Actually, we'd like to be minimizing all the time. So let's talk a little bit about that now. So we'll switch back. Okay, so we did this like a uh, little example. And uh, what did we do? This. So this was like this function. And again, I'll post a notebook so you guys can try this out and play around yourselves, which you should always do. Um, and we started. Uh, we started at like one, one and a half, uh, minus one and a half, and then zero. And this one uh, maximized, which is bad. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to minimize. Um, okay, so like takeaway message from this little sort of example is that Um, basically, right, um, Newton is a local sort of local root finding method. It's going to always find the closest fixed point to the initial guess, and that could be a max min or saddle. And we kind of just the way we wrote it down here, the naive Newton method, there's no saying where it's going to go. It could do any of these things.
Okay, and yeah, we, we don't want this, right? We want to be minimizing. So how do we uh, make sure we minimize? Uh, this is what we're going to talk about next. So um, to get into this, I'm going to talk about sufficient conditions for a uh, local optimum. So this gradient equals zero condition, that's called a first order necessary condition. What that means is that, you know, if we're at a minimum, the gradient has to be zero, right? At a minimum, but the gradient being, but it's not an if and only if, uh, one implies the other, right? So being at a min implies the gradient has to be zero. If the gradient zero, doesn't mean necessarily that you're at a min. You could also be at a max. You could also be a saddle, right? So there's only a, like a one-way implication there. Um, So necessary, but not sufficient. We need something else to make sure we're at a minimum. And um, the easiest way to, to kind of get into this, and the most intuitive way, I think, is to, to look at the Newton step again and think about it in the scalar case. Okay. And specifically, I might lean on some of you guys who've done like some gradient descent, machine learning type stuff in the past. So let's look at this, um, this Newton step real quick. Okay, so the thing on the right here, this is the gradient, right? And um, if I were just thinking about this as gradient descent, right? I have the gradient, I have a minus sign out front here that sort of says to go down, go in the opposite direction of the gradient. And then the Hessian thing in here, what does this look like from like your sort of maybe machine learning -y gradient descent experiences? It means like the second derivative? No, but I mean like what, what it's in the space, if I were just doing gradient descent, what would be in that spot? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, uh, or I mean, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't have a matrix there. You'd have something else, right? A scalar. Yeah, a scalar <laughs> what? Learning rate. Learning rate, right? So, okay. So one way to think about this is that this thing is the Hessian here, the inverse Hessian in particular, is serving the role of a learning rate uh, or, or step length. If you're more of a classical optimization person, right? If you're not a machine learning person. Okay, so the idea is, yeah, when I do this Newton thing, I have my gradient, I have a minus sign out front, meaning go down, the descend opposite direction of the gradient. And then I've got this inverse Hessian thing here, taking the, the place of a learning rate or step length, um, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so can now, based on this kind of intuition, can you tell me, like, is there a condition on the Hessian that I need to make sure I'm actually descending versus? Be positive. Right? Yeah, so if it's a scalar like here, it just has to be positive, right? So in particular, um, in order to make this descent, if I'm doing gradient descent, the this Hessian inverse thing here, the learning rate needs to be positive. If it goes negative, then I'm not going down anymore. I'm going uphill in the positive gradient direction, right? It's gonna flip me around. So um, we can say del squared F positive um, implies descent, uh, means we're minimizing. And del squared F uh, negative means ascent or hill climbing or whatever, or maximization. 
Okay. Um, so yeah, this is the scalar case. The extending this to the, the vector case is trivial and, and people already said this out loud. So in the RN uh, sort of case, um, we want the Hessian matrix to be strictly positive definite. And there's this weird, you know, succession notation for this or whatever. Another way to write this um, is tell squared F in uh, S N uh, S N plus plus. It's the same, these mean the same thing. Positive definite. And this means that all its eigenvalues are positive or equivalently that it's positive in any direction. Right. So it's really just the same thing as the scalar case, just in every single direction, right? Like if all the eigenvalues are positive, that means it gives you a positive scalar in any direction vector you plug into it, right? Um, professor? Yep. Uh, you said that the Hessian is the step length. But like my understanding is that the Hessian would be just the direction and step length would be one in this case, because- so Specifically, right, we're talking here, up here about the scalar case, right? Uh, so in the scalar case, uh, the Hessian is just a, a number, just a scalar, right? And this del squared F inverse thing over here, right, this guy, this is just a number, just a scalar, right? And so it's, it's sort of, taking the role of a learning rate or step length, right, in, in gradient descent. And there you can think about it as sort of like an optimal learning rate. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in the RN like vector case where it's a matrix, then it's not just a step length, right? There it is changing the direction as well. So that's a little bit more complicated, um, but the, the kind of intuition is still the same, basically. Um, you can always write, you can always like diagonalize that thing with like an eigen decomposition. Um, and in that case, you would want it to always po be positive in any direction, which means all those eigenvalues have to be positive. If any of those eigenvalues has a negative sign in it, that means if you put in a vector in that particular direction, along with one of, that has a, you know, aligned with one of those eigenvectors corresponding to the negative eigenvalue, in that particular direction, you're going to go uphill instead of downhill. Right, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. That's that's what we're getting at. Yeah. So the intuition is definitely the scalar case, right? Um, and then like it generalizes kind of pretty trivially to to Rn. Okay. So um, that's sort of the Newton story and the intuition behind this and what's going on. Uh, there's a couple of just kind of terminology things then to follow up with uh, here. So um, if our function is um, uh, if our function uh, has a Hessian that is strictly positive definite everywhere, so if del squared F is always positive definite, this is um, the quote, this is uh, what we call then um, a uh, strongly convex function. So if, if we write down an F and we can show that its Hessian is always positive definite anywhere, then uh, we say that F is strictly convex. And the implication there is that Newton's method will always work uh, because these conditions on, on you know, descent and all this kind of stuff are automatically always satisfied and life is good, right? So this is one of the reasons convex optimization is such a big deal and why there's so much theory about it. It's that like there are the problems we always know how to solve essentially. Um, so that's nice. If we have, if we happen to have a strongly convex F, life is good. We could just do Newton, not worry about it, and it'll always find us the, the, uh, the global minimum. Um, 
However, for most problems that we care about, particularly in optimal control, anytime you're dealing with like a nonlinear uh, system, like a robot, uh, this is not the case, unfortunately. So we have to play some more games to kind of apply this in, uh, in general. Okay, so um, what do we do in the hard case? Uh, so, in, you know, like the case we just saw, right, in the example where it went up instead of down, how do we fix that and make sure we're always going downhill? Um, the answer is something called regularization. So this is sort of like basically a hack, um, but there's some good theory behind it and it, it works really well and basically every um, nonlinear solver does this. So here's what you do. Um, first, we're going to evaluate our Hessian and we're going to sort of put that in some variable H. Then we're going to check H. And we're going to do the following thing. So while H is not positive definite, uh, we're going to basically pad H with a multiple of the identity. So we're going to do H gets, it's a horrible. Horrible handwriting. <laughs> H gets some like scalar beta times the identity. And this is. Some like scalar hyperparameter. That we pick. Uh, so we do this until H is positive definite and the idea right is we're basically padding all the eigenvalues by, by adding this multiple of the identity. And eventually, if there's any negative ones, eventually they're going to be pushed positive by adding this multiple of the identity. Yeah, if you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so here, uh, does H like get added, like the uh, scalar uh, multiple of the identity matrix, or does it sorry, get sorry. scalar? Yeah, this was bad. Uh, OK, thanks. Add Zach, thanks for pointing that out. And this should be, obviously, this is H plus beta i. So basically, I want to add, a, uh, keep adding a multiple of the identity to H, right? And padding its eigenvalues up until they're all positive. Um, and then once I've got that to work, once I've, like, I just do this in a loop until H is strictly positive definite. Once that's true, then I go ahead and do my normal Newton step using H instead of the, the real Hessian. And then you know, the usual thing, X gets uh, X plus delta X. Okay, so that's kind of, we're gonna, re we're gonna basically stick this Hessian padding trick into Newton's method. Uh, this also goes, so this is called regularization, this kind of padding of a Hessian trick. Um, when you do this inside Newton's method, it's sometimes referred to as damped. Uh, so a damped Newton's method. that. Um, and the idea is what this is doing, it's simultaneously doing two things. Number one is it's, um, it's guaranteeing that you get a positive descent step or that you're getting a descent right step by making sure that Hessian's positive uh, definite and making sure you're not flipping and doing ascent. It's also doing something else. Um, remember in, in the Newton step, uh, H inverse is showing up there and acting like a step length or, or a learning rate, right? So by making H bigger and bigger with like this multiple of the identity, we're making H inverse smaller and smaller. So we're also shrinking the step size that the Newton uh, method is going to take and sort of making it like more conservative in some sense, more cautious and take smaller steps, which if you're in a situation where H is indefinite, 
um, and it means you're kind of like far away from a uh, local optima and you're doing this padding of the Hessian trick anyway, things are a little sketchy. Um, you, you maybe like don't, shouldn't be doing this, right? Like you shouldn't be taking big steps there maybe and you shouldn't really be trusting your tailored expansion uh, a lot. Um, so that's kind of, okay. So now we're gonna go switch back to the example. And we're gonna do this. So um, let's check, first thing is let's check the Hessian at that starting point we had last time. Uh, and sure enough, it's negative, right? So it's it's doing ascent, not descent. So we could have kind of predicted that. Um, and then we're now gonna implement this regularization trick. I'm gonna set beta to one, uh, and we're just gonna do this kind of exactly what we did before. Uh, H set equal, equal to the Hessian. I'm gonna check if it's positive definite. If it's not positive definite, I'm gonna pad it. Uh, and then I'm gonna, once that's worked, I'm gonna just do my normal Newton thing. Now I'm gonna start in the exact same spot. And then I'm gonna go ahead and like take these Newton steps. Let's see what happens now. So um, in this particular case, I like, this is kind of interesting. We'll talk about this in a sec. I went right. So I went in the right direction. I, I went in like the descent direction instead of the uphill direction, but I overshot the minimum, which is maybe bad. So we're gonna talk about that next. Um, but if I keep running, you know, this, it goes downhill now and it sort of settles into the expected spot. So we're finding the nearest local minimum now instead of the nearest local max. That's good, right? Um, okay, so uh, regularization fixes, uh, fixes the descent versus ascent thing and make sure we always go downhill and always find a minimum. Um, but we still have this other issue to fix, which is this kind of overshoot problem. Uh, but we are now out of time, I think partially because of my technical snafus. There was like one more thing I wanted to do, but um, we'll do that next time. It'll take like five more minutes. So uh, I'll let you guys go. If anyone has questions, I'll hang out for a little bit. Um, and then I'll also kind of uh, go back and write down this last piece. Hey, Zach. Yep. Is it, so, so what happens if you enforce a second conditional in that while loop, say, if the eigenvalues are also greater than a certain value or, or less than a certain value? Can you constrain that step size? Yeah, so that's sort of one way to go. There's another way to go. Uh, so, yeah, you can, like, um, try to, like, keep jacking up uh, that regularization to shrink the step size in an effort to not have this overshoot behavior. Um, that's actually kind of related to a, um, an optimization strategy called uh, a trust region method. A uh, little more complicated, but that's sort of headed in that direction. There's another way to go though, which is what we're actually gonna talk about next time, uh, which is, it's called a line search. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. I'll, I'll do it at the beginning of class next time. It's, uh, it'll be quick and I'll just kind of finish up this discussion. Uh, so it's okay. a slightly different trick. Okay, so just to finish this up, but yeah, anyone has questions, feel free. Hey, Zach. Uh, what, uh, yeah, go ahead. Just a go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I wonder uh, if adding this beta term to the Hessian will lead to any new local optimum? Uh, no, right, because uh, what's the condition for an optimum? Um, so it's zero, right? What's I mean, zero? So being these these uh hessian equals zero no um, what am i doing root finding on in newton's method yes finding the gradients something equals zero right that's right Basically, the gradient equation well i'm 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 setting i'm solving for gradient equals zero right so yep. the having a fixed point depends on the gradient and when i do yep. this regularization i'm not touching the gradient right i'm only touching the hessian so uh, it, it's not modifying the actual sort of landscape of the function uh, and, and where you have local optima at all. I see, got it, thanks. Yep. Um, I have a question. So when we were doing the regularization, uh, why are we like adding beta, not doing something else like say flip those 
element that are uh, negative? Yeah, so that's also a reasonable strategy. Uh, and you could totally do that. And in this particular case, you could absolutely do that. The reason we don't do it that way in general is that actually computing that eigen decomposition for a big matrix is super expensive, like more expensive than just solving the linear system inside you to begin with. And we also, we already said that that's like n cubed and expensive when we kind of don't like doing it right for big problems. So, so doing what you're suggesting, like actually computing a full eigen decomposition for, imagine this is like a 10,000 dimensional problem, right? Which is not crazy at all for, for a large trajectory optimization problem. If H is 10,000 by 10,000, computing a 10,000 by 10,000, you know, eigen decomposition, super expensive. Um, and then you'd have to go in, right, flip the signs, and then you still have to solve the linear system at the end of this. So that's why we don't do it. Um, this particular trick of just adding some multiple of the identity uh, and then checking if H is positive definite, it turns out we can check if H is positive definite or not much, much cheaper than computing a full eigen decomposition. So that's why we, it's, this is numerically cheaper if you're dealing with large problems. Um, specifically, how you practically check for positive definiteness, the simplest and quickest way is to try computing a Cholesky factorization of H. And Cholesky only works on positive definite matrices. And so it will fail if, if the matrix happens to have any negative eigenvalues. Uh, so you can basically just try doing a Cholesky uh, factorization and Cholesky will like error out and fail and yell at you if, if it has, uh, if it's not positive definite. And then you just do this padding trick and then repeat. So this is POSDEF function that we used in Julia to, to check this is not doing an eigen decomposition. It's doing sort of much faster, cheaper, tricky things. Okay, cool. Uh, so we'll like, I imagine the previous overshoot problem is caused by this padding. So if we do like the, the, the eigen decomposition and flips the sign, will it solve? So that's not quite right. Um, it turns out the overshoot problem is sort of another problem. It's an independent, it's oh, independent right. of this issue. Yeah. You can get overshooting even on like strongly convex functions. It, okay. it basically has to do with the fact that like at the end of the day, we're using like a lower Taylor expansion to approximate F. And if oh, F is, okay. is a lot more sort of wiggly or curved than that, you're not going to have, the approximation is not that great. And in that case, it's like pretty easy to overshoot. So yeah, you can you can design like uh, kind of like particularly nasty convex functions that will have these overshoot issues, uh, even if they're strict, strongly convex and don't need the regularization. Cool, thank you. And we're gonna talk about how to fix that next time. Uh, professor, uh, how can we uh, make sure that our loop is driving us to the right direction? Uh, like to the direction of the local minimum. Um, so, so I guess exactly what sort of sort of situation are you referring to here? Yeah. So, like, um, like we just said, kind of, you know, um, if you're the the answer is generally do Newton's method, and Newton's method has a couple of quirks that can cause you problems. The first one is that you might go uphill instead of downhill if the Hessian is not strictly positive definite. So to fix that, the answer is you regularize the Hessian until it's positive definite, and then you're guaranteed to go downhill. Um, there's also the overshoot problem, separate problem, uh, but that's sort of a different problem, different flavor of problem. Like as long as your Hessian's positive definite, which you can guarantee by doing this regularization trick, you'll go downhill for sure. Does that sort of answer the question? I'm not sure. Uh, like, but in in the loop inside the loop, do we always put a plus sign? What do you sign? What do you mean by inside the loop? In here, uh, inside uh, in, inside this while loop. loop. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in here, I'm always adding. Uh, you know, so beta is positive. Mm -hmm. Does that help? So I'm adding a positive multiple of the identity here. So the idea is, right, if I make beta really big, then H has to be positive definite, right? Like I could like, okay, so practically speaking, if whatever H is, if beta is bigger than the, you know, biggest eigenvalue uh, in H, then it's gonna always be, you know, positive, right? 
Yeah, I can make beta big enough that it basically dominates, you know, over H, and like I'm effectively just getting having a really big, you know, positive okay. identity matrix in there. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, professor, I have a question mm -hmm. uh, regarding as as ness necessarily the Hessian is the like uh, the, the the step. So can't it be just replaced by some constant positive definite matrix? And it no, uh, no, yeah. So so the step length thing is strictly really only true in the scalar like one D scalar case. In the N D case, it's not just a step length; it's also changing the direction, right? Uh, uh yeah. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, in in N dimensions, it's more subtle and it is actually moving the descent direction quite a bit if, away from the, the gradient direction. It's not just a length thing. And yeah, if you, if you uh, so there's lots of what are called quasi-Newton methods, which are um, ways of approximating Newton's method that are cheaper because like we said, right, like forming this Hessian matrix and inverting it and all that can be quite expensive for large problems. So there's lots of um, approximations people make to Newton's method to try to make it cheaper so-called quasi-Newton methods, all of those are trying to approximate H inverse some other cheaper way than evaluating it and completely refactorizing it every step. Lots of ways to do that, to, to save on compute, but like you can't just use a, a kind of constant positive matrix in there. Um, that would be, if you did that, right, that's basically just doing gradient descent now with a fixed learning rate, which we know kind of doesn't work, right? Correct, yes, thank you. Professor? Yeah. Um, I had a question about the padding, the padding equation. So when we are adding um, beta times identity to the Hessian, what we are doing is we are basically changing all the diagonal elements of the Hessian by equal amount. Yeah. So um, will that, like, how exactly does it change the descent direction? So like in way, and how do we make sure that we are not altering the Hessian completely or like, I'm a little confused by that. So, I mean, you, you are altering the Hessian completely, right? Like you are altering it a whole bunch. Um, like this is a hack. Um, this is kind of the standard hack um, because it's cheap to do. There are more sophisticated hacks you can try to do to like minimally perturb the Hessian. Like you could, for example, if, if it's a small problem and you're willing to like, you know, do the compute, you can sit there and compute an eigen decomposition, a full eigen decomposition of H, and then go into that eigen decomposition and only change the negative eigenvalues. So you could do something like that, right? Like, like someone mentioned earlier. Um, that's going to be really expensive though, compared to this, right? So for a small problem, you could get away with this. For a big problem, like 10,000 variables or, or whatever, like the sort of problems we're gonna have in, in optimal control, it's too expensive to do that. And uh, this kind of simple hack is, is kind of the, the standard thing to do. So yes, yeah, so you absolutely are like massively perturbing the Hessian and you're not getting the true Newton step. And as a result, it might take you more steps to converge. Um, but the idea with this uh, is that these, um, this, this sort of trick, it's only necessary when you're far away from the optimum. And so you might have to do it for the first couple of steps, but then once you're sort of in the ballpark of a local minimum, H is gonna be positive definite. And so then you can stop doing this. So these, um, these kind of hacks are, are sort of only there to fix up bad behavior when you're far away from the answer. Once you get close to the answer, these problems kind of disappear and then you can do full Newton steps and get really fast uh, convergence at the end, which is ultimately kind of what matters. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, also another question about um, line search. So uh, I, I'm familiar with our Mio line search. Mm -hmm. Is that the same line search you're talking about? Yep, that's exactly what we were going to talk about at the end today, but uh, we're going to do it next time because uh, we ran out of time. So yes, that is exactly what we're talking about, our, the Armijo rule kind of line search. All right. All right, I'm just going to wait until the next class to ask questions on that. Okay, sure. Thank you. Yep.
he's a uh, similar question to the previous question like i wanted to understand what you're losing out on by so you're basically not paying the cost of repairing each of the negative eigen values right yeah so what what are you losing out on uh, by doing this simple uh, plus beta i yeah so you're you're perturbing all the eigen values now right yeah. and in particular you're making them all bigger or all more positive right right and what you're really doing there you're doing kind of two things so you're fixing up any negative ones you're um you're essentially what you're doing is you're turning the 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 step you're turning the newton step closer to a gradient step right so in the limit as beta gets really big and just like dominates over h um, really what you're getting then is a minus beta times grad f right so in the limit right. of large beta where h sort of doesn't matter anymore you're really just getting gradient descent at that point and you're doing it with a step length of one over beta gotcha yeah. right because it's yeah. it's h inverse so you're getting essentially right. one over beta times grad f at that point in the limit of really large beta so you're you're essentially like you can think of it a, a bunch of ways another interpretation of this is that you're like interpolating between a newton step and a gradient step right. and right. by jacking up beta you're sort of turning the, the step closer to the gradient descent direction gotcha perfect thank you and also shrinking the step length and right. that shrinking step length thing is also generally desirable in this context because you're perturbing everything you're approximating everything you know more it's more approximate right and so we're we're saying like in eh, my approximation less kind of, confident about uh, exactly you're saying my approximation is a little sketchy here i'm less confident in my taylor expansion approximation being good now so it's not a bad idea to also take a smaller step got you perfect thank you yep anybody else one question professor like if as a follow-up question to the last question like if you are increasing beta aren't you also shrinking the step size so in the limit when beta goes to infinity even the step size would go to zero yes that's absolutely right yep so, so like can we like if you don't look at it in terms of infinities can we just say that when we are increasing beta we are more focusing on eigenvalues that are bigger than on eigenvalues that are smaller or like some some kind of spectral shift in the gradient direction yeah so yeah what you're doing there right is you're you're making the uh the steps will be shorter obviously in, in directions with larger eigenvalues right and bigger in directions with more negative eigenvalues mm -hmm. that makes sense which yeah. is actually what you want because the directions with negative eigenvalues um have negative curvature and means they are actually going down so like that's actually okay and, and sort of maybe desirable as well so i mean there's there's a bunch of kind of fuzzy interpretation kind of things here um i would say that the, probably the, the best way to think about this is it's number one it's kind of a heuristic hack uh but you you know it's theoretically well grounded um and, and makes sense and you can mm -hmm. prove that it works uh, but it's essentially doing it's doing two things it's taking your newton step and turning it closer to a gradient descent step so it's that sort of direction wise it's making it go closer to the gradient descent direction right and then number two is it's shrinking the step length those are the two things and you can like sort of interpret that a million ways but practically like that's sort of you know the flavor of what's mm -hmm. going on um yeah in the limit of large beta it just totally goes towards the gradient descent step if you're somewhere in the middle you're you're going to effectively get larger steps in the directions corresponding to the most negative eigenvalues of h right mm -hmm. yeah. which is which is desirable because those are directions of negative curvature that are sort of curving down right mm -hmm. Not... yeah that's everything thank you professor all right anybody else